with us this morning. Let's all stand. We'll start with, Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Brother Daniel, my so good to be in the house of the Lord. So good to see all of you. The psalmist said, I was glad, glad, glad. Y'all know what glad means, don't you? Amen. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Boy, I'm glad this morning to be here. I hope you're glad to be here. Are you glad? Amen. Wonderful. Thank God for all of his blessings. We've got so much to praise him for. Some of you are missing that hour. Are you missing that hour? Good. I hope you'll say that at the end of the service too. That's my, uh, that's my aim today, not to mess around. Hey Amen. I asked, I asked folks, i got preacher friends in this county and other counties too, and sometimes I'll run into some of their members. I know some of their members that go to their church. And uh, I preach for them in different places and different things. I run into them. And I always ask them. And I'll say, uh, I run into some of your members this week. They said, you did? I said, yeah, I asked them, did you preach Sunday or did you just mess around? So I don't want to mess around today. I just want to honor the Lord and uh, just use this time to glorify him. And let's just worship him today. That's what it's all about, isn't it? And so let's just honor him and worship him today. We got so much to praise him for. I love these kids, don't you? So good to have them in the service, to have them running around. Boy, I'm telling you, they're, they're the future of our church, and I'm thankful for them. Praise God. Let's pray together. Ask the Lord to help us. He knows what we stand in need of. While I'm on that subject of the kids, next Sunday they're going to be involved in learning about Easter and having an Easter egg hunt and all that stuff. And so uh, Sister Ann told me, she said, just tell them to come and bring a bucket or a hat or what else do you say? A uh, bucket or bas bu bucket, basket, hat, anything you want to bring. Uh, they don't have to bring any eggs, just bring that. And she's going to go to the Easter story with them, and she's going to help them. And, uh, boy, they're going to have a marvelous time, and it's going to be great. So we're excited about that. So you tell them to come on next Sunday. And we'll have a good time in the Lord's house. Next Sunday is also Brotherhood. And uh, men's excited about that. 8 o'clock next Sunday morning. Don't forget that. Other things in the bulletin as well. And so uh, uh, don't forget all of our announcements. So let's pray together. Father, we are grateful and thankful for the privilege to be in the house. What we gather here for. You're so good to us in so many ways. And we have so much to praise you for. And so much to thank you for. And, Lord, we just come to worship you this morning and adore you. I thank you, Lord, for the privilege to be in your house. And, Lord, I thank you for each one who's here. 
You know the hearts and lives and needs of every person. You know how to help us today. So I ask you, Lord, you do that in a marvelous way. We'll praise you for all you do in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Amen. All right, Brother Daniel, come on. Amen.
Stand in fellowship as the choir comes down this way. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilt, grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within, grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. Dark is the stain that we cannot hide. What can avail to wash it away? Look, there is flowing a crimson tide. Whiter than snow you may be today. Marvelous, infinite, matchless grace freely bestowed on all who believe. You that are longing to see His face, will you this moment His grace receive? Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within grace grace god's grace grace that is greater than all our sin thank you brother daniel wonderful song wonderful song amen if you have your bibles with you open them to the book of hebrews the book of hebrews chapter number nine Hebrews chapter number 9. I'm interested this morning in the latter part of that chapter. Hebrews chapter number 9. We'll look at these last five verses. Hebrews chapter number 9. I'm going to look at these last uh, five verses here and uh, where the writer of the book of Hebrews is going to tell us about the Lord Jesus appearing here in these verses. Now I want you to see him as he appears in these last five verses. He's going to appear three times. In these last five verses as I read them to us, there are three appearances here and the writer of the book of Hebrews is going to show us something that God, the Lord Jesus, is doing for us as he is appearing in these verses it has to do with our salvation. Salvation is a uh, threefold word. What I mean by that is I am saved at this moment. I trusted the Lord Jesus as my personal Savior when God convicted my heart and opened my understanding through his call to my life. I realized I was a sinner and I trusted him by faith. God saved me. And that was a personal experience for me. 
I was saved. I am being saved. That's the second word I'm going to talk about this morning. And then, of course, I am saved. I am being saved, and I will be saved. Uh, those are the terms that the Bible speaks of and the literal uh, appearances of the Lord Jesus here. The writer of the book of Hebrews is showing us in this book concerning the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, the work of salvation in our lives. Threefold word. We are saved from the penalty of sin. That's what happens, of course, when God opens our understanding. You'll never be saved till God calls you. So God opens your understanding. Somebody said, I'll get saved when I want to. No, you won't. You'll never get saved till God calls you, till God opens your understanding, till God opens your heart. And, of course, you realize you are a lost sinner. And then we're saved, of course, forever from the penalty of sin. By faith, we trust the Lord Jesus, and we're saved concerning our past, present, and future. And then, of course, we're saved from the power of sin, being saved from the power of sin. That's what's happening in my life now, being saved from the power of sin, a process, a sanctification, big word we talk about, but it's literally a, a transaction that's being done every day of my life. And I'm thankful for that, continuing uh, in my life. And then one day, hallelujah, Oh, my. I got to thinking about that early this morning. I'm telling you, one of these days, Sister Karen's going to come drag it in here. And y'all going to say, what in the matter is, what in the wrong is, Sister, what, how, what happened to Sister Karen? And she's going to say, y'all just don't understand this man I live with. He woke me up this morning at 4 o'clock, running through the house, shouting. I couldn't go back to sleep. Every time I try to lay down, he starts shouting again. I'm trying my best to contain myself over there. But boy, I had a spell this morning. I'll show you where it happened at here in the sermon in just a moment. One of these days, I'm going to be saved from the very presence of sin. Whoo, look out. Man, when that happens, I'm telling you, the Bible says nothing will enter in that defileth. I preached on that a few weeks ago when I talked about heaven, anything of an abomination, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book. And Boy, I'm looking forward to that day, aren't you? The very presence of sin. I walk in a world that's full of sin. I walk in a sin-cursed body and have to put up with that, but one of these days amongst sinful people. I know y'all don't. Yeah, you do. You know what I'm talking about. Have to put up with them. Sister Karen has put up one of the worst ones. She lives with them. I ain't talking about her. I'm talking about me. I have to look in the mirror at one of the worst ones. And, of course, one of these days the Lord's going to come back, and he's going to change this old vile body. Hallelujah. And it'll be a perfect place. Stand with me, if you will, and uh, we'll read these five verses. Hebrews chapter 9, beginning with verse number 24. The Bible says here, for Christ is not entered into the holy place made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entered into the holy place every year with blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Look at verse 27. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. You may be seated. I want to look at these verses for a few moments. I want you to see these three appearances of Christ in these verses. Now you'll find the word appear or appeared 
in these verses, these five verses I've read to you this morning. Verse number 24, you see one of his great appearances there. Will you read that word appear? In verses 25 and 26, he's speaking of the Levitical law, the Levitical sacrifices of the Old Testament, and how again and again that high priest went in and with the sin offering, the burn offerings, the meal offerings, the peace offerings, and then on once a year he offered, of course, that offering of atonement for the sins, the blood of the sinless lamb, and that was the offering of atonement, and he says that he done this offering over and over again, year after year, often, over and over, often. But then to the contrast here, he says, the high priest, our high priest, the Old Testament entered into the holy place made with hands, but Jesus has entered into the holy place not made with hands, the true place that is in the heavens. The high priest entered into again and again, but Christ offered himself once in the end of the world, hath put away uh, put it, hath appeared and put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. You see it there in verse number 26. Hath appeared, the Bible says. And that's, uh, of course, the second time we find that word appear or appeared. And then down in verses 27, 28, you're going to see that word again. Of course, he's talking here about the completed work of the Lord Jesus in those verses, the Old Testament dispensation. In verse uh, 26, he's talking about that Old Testament dispensation, the end of the law, the end of the dispensation, the end of the world didn't take place, the end of the age, the dispensation took place. But not under the Old Testament law anymore. That's the, reason, that's the reason I didn't bring a lamb with me this morning to offer sacrifice and worship, because that's ended. The veil of the temple was rent from the top to the bottom. Man couldn't do that with his hands. I'll say some more about that probably next week as we start looking at the, uh, the crucifixion as we head toward the cross for Easter. Amazing. That, that veil was so, hey, it was, it, it was a hand's width thick. That's how thick it was. Imagine a cloth that thick. You couldn't, you couldn't tear it in two. As a matter of fact, that was one of the, uh, that was one of the tests of the veil itself. It had to be tested with oxen to make sure it's strong enough to withstand the oxen pull. To be qualified for the veil of the Holy of Holies. And the Bible talks about it here. But when Jesus died, that thing was rent, not from the bottom. Mankind didn't get a hold of it from the bottom, rip it open. God ripped it from the top to the bottom. Opening up the way for us to have access to him because of the purchase that had been made with the blood of the Holy Lamb of God. Amen. Woo, don't get me excited yet. Now, I ain't got started yet. We ain't even got to the introduction. That's, of course, the continuing appearance of the Lord Jesus. And then we find the crowning appearance here in verse number 28. You see it there? The Bible said, he's, he's going to appear. Shall unto them that look for him shall appear the second time without seeing unto salvation. So I want us to look at for a few moments this morning these three appearances of Christ and how they, how they uh, refer to us, how they apply to us in the plan of salvation for us what God has for us in this appearance of Christ. The Bible talks about it with great understanding of these great appearances of Christ and understand God's grace. Daniel just sung about this marvelous grace. This grace of God that hath appeared unto us and it teaches us, it helps us understand how much God loves us. So I want us to see, first of all, the, complete, the completed appearance of of Christ. Here in verse number 26, the Bible talks about it. It is a completed appearance. In other words, he completed something when he appeared here in verse number 26. The Bible says, for then must he oft have suffered since the foundation of the world, but now once in the end of the world, the end of the age, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Verse number 28 says, So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. When he died on that cross, he took his own blood and appeared in the Holy of Holies, which are a figure of the truth, the Bible says, in the heavens, and applied his own blood once and for all, for all, uh, for you and I. 
And you can understand what the New Testament is saying here in this passage when you understand how you and I are secure in our salvation. We can't lose our salvation. It's right here illustrated in exactly what Jesus has done for us and what the writer of the book of Hebrews says. The writer of the book of Hebrews makes it clear. Here and in many other places here in the book of Hebrews, he talks about it. He says, Christ was once offered. Once offered for the sacrifice, for the payment for sins. There's not a contradiction here to the Old Testament sacrifices. In the Old Testament, they had to keep offering sacrifices all the time for sin. They were rolling that sin debt forward. It, the blood of calves and goats and, and lambs, it wouldn't take away the, the sin of, the, of mankind. But Jesus, that holy Lamb of God, John saw him when he appeared there on earth. And you remember what John said? John chapter, uh, the, the gospel of John, John the Baptist is baptizing and the apostle John wrote it down, two different Johns. He saw him as he appeared there as John is baptizing, the forerunner of Christ. And he said, behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And that's exactly what Jesus did. He came into this world to take away the sin of the world. And with his own sacrifice, his own blood, he came into this world to take away the sin of the world. Once every year, the sacrifice of atonement was made for a nation. They take that sinless lamb, and on the high day of atonement, that priest had to first cleanse himself. He had to be clean. That's the reason he had the robe that he had, a particular robe. And he had to put on, it had bells on it, Brother Tim, around the bottom. You know why? And they tie a rope around his foot, around his ankle. You know why? He'd enter that holy of holies, Brother Andy. If he wasn't clean, Brother Dale, if he wasn't right with God, God strike him dead in that holy of holies. Why'd they tie, why'd they tie a rope around his ankle, Brother Barry? Because if he wasn't clean, somebody could try to go in there and get him. God strike them dead. You didn't go in that holy of holies. No, sir. God is a holy God. God is a righteous God. God don't play. Amen. Somebody said, I quit school because they had recess. I don't play. God's worse than that. God strike you down. He cares about holiness. Back in the Old Testament, he illustrated vividly that very fact. He cares about holiness. So he tied, they had to tie a rope around him because he went back there unclean. Boy, they didn't hear those bells moving. He wasn't moving back there in the Holy Holy. I won't tell you, he didn't, he didn't waste no time back there either, brother. I wouldn't have either. He took that blood of that innocent lamb who had been checked and checked and rechecked without blemish and without spot, shed innocent blood, and he sprinkled that mercy seat. And then he got out of there. He wasn't wasting no time. No, sir, he got out of there. And if he went back there unclean, God struck him dead and they'd drag him out by that rope. They'd have to get another priest. He'd have to be clean. He'd have to be checked. Boy, imagine that. Somebody said, I'd like to be high. No, I wouldn't. Huh? Boy, I'm telling you. Huh? God took it serious. God takes sin serious. Why would God take sin that serious, my brother? Why would, take sin, why would God take sin that serious, my sister? Because it cost him his only begotten dear son on the cross. That's why, that's why I separated the fellowship between him and man. That's why, that's why God takes it so serious. Oh, the Bible talks about it year after year after year, hundreds and hundreds of years. And then Christ came on the scene and put away the sin by the offering of himself. Not hundreds of times, but the offering of himself one time. He was the pure spotless lamb of God. And he died on that cross and took his own blood into the holy of holies, not the figure of the true, but the true in heaven, and offered his own blood for the sin of the whole world. Your sins, my sins, the sins of the whole world. That's the reason you find what? John chapter 19, verse number 30, he's hanging on that cross. He's come to the end of those hours in darkness. Man. Study that cross, boy, it's amazing. 12 o'clock high. Sun's way up there, boy, it's bright. And all of a sudden, 
the father said, I, I can't bear this. I, I, I'm not going to look on, I'm not going to look on sin. I'm going to pour the sin of the world upon my son. The wrath of sin was poured out upon Jesus. And God the Father turned his back on his only begotten son. And the son, the S-U-N, went out. Darkness. Well, wouldn't that be frightening? Now, we're, we're, we're sitting here today. I mean, uh, it's a little after 11. Everything's looking good outside. We got these lights around the uh, windows around the side of the sanctuary. Everything's, boy, I guarantee you, watch me real careful now. I guarantee you. Every one of us here, are, I guess, uh, okay as far as uh, things are going. We we pretty calm. We know the SUN's up there. We last time we checked, everything's going good. We ain't heard no weather reports that the SUN's having problems. But I promise you, in the fear of God, if it went dark right now, we'd have a problem. If all of a sudden that thing went to the way it was this morning about 3 o'clock in the morning. And that security light come on out there. And these lights in here was the only thing we got. We look outside and it was pitch black. And it stayed that way for about three hours. We'd be wondering what's going on. That's exactly what happened. And Jesus is hanging there. And he says, Telesta! Ain't nobody here Greek, are they? If you was, you know exactly what that means. So let me put it in English. It is finished! Completed. Done. What I came here to do. It's paid in full is literally what that means. It's finished. What he done to carry out the complete plan of God. He didn't say, watch this. He didn't say, I am finished. He said, it is finished. Boy, I'm glad of that, aren't you? Oh, some of them demons was probably having a fit saying, he's finished. No, he's not finished. <laughs> Woo, it's just getting started for you and I. Hallelujah. Oh, I'm telling you, he, he, he said it is finished. What was he finishing? First of all, his suffering was finished. Oh, he'd been agonizing. He'd been agonizing long before this cross because he knew that's what he came into this world for. As a matter of fact, he came to offer himself. He suffered, he suffered for a finite period of time so that you and I would not have to suffer an infinite period of time. That we could be redeemed. Oh yes, you see, you realize we're saved from the awful penalty of eternity without God. He suffered a infinite, a finite time of 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 time without his heavenly father so that you and I would not have to suffer, suffer eternity without the father. Think about that. On that cross, six hours. And in those six hours, he suffered everything that you and I would not have to experience so that you and I would not have to experience all of the tragedy of without God. Salvation is free, but it's not cheap. It costs Jesus his life. He wasn't held to that cross by those nails. He wasn't held to that cross by the guards. He was held to that cross by the love that he had and the plan to obey the Father's will. The grace, to bring about the grace that you and I could have oh yes, by trusting the Lord. The suffering of Christ was finished. You remember he had prayed in that garden. Matthew chapter 26, verse number 39. He went a little farther, fell on his face, and he prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if it be past possible, let this cup pass from me. You know what he's saying? Father, if there's any other way for people to be saved, let this cup pass. If there's any other way for them to experience salvation, bring it to, bring it to pass. There wasn't no other way. If there's any other way, he's anticipating going to die and suffer hell, separation from the Father. 
He said, if there's any other way. But then he said in the same sentence, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Oh, yes, thy will be done. So Christ was once offered. He offered himself. The suffering was now finished. Not only was suffering finished, but salvation was finished. When he said it is finished, his salvation was finished. Now, most people, they interpret salvation with one of two words. Do. D-O. Do. Works. Brother Ricky brought a great message on works the other night. Boy, I hope you heard it. If you didn't, it's still online. You ought to go back and listen to it. Works. One of the most definite words that people use is D-O. Works. Most religions require works for salvation. Most religions require works for salvation. You have to do this. You have to do that. You have to live by the Ten Commandments. Or you have to live a righteous life. You have to live by this and do this. Do these rules. Do that rules. And of course, they, 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 in order to be saved, you have to live a righteous life. You have to I have never sinned. You have to live by a single uh, rule book. Do, do, do. They spell salvation. D-O, do. Or, there's another group. Claim salvation by the word don't. D-O-N-T. Hmm. It's about as popular as the word do. <clears throat> don't do this. Don't do that. Don't do the other. I don't do this, so I know I'm okay. I don't do that what the other folks do down there, so I, I think I'm okay. I don't drink. I don't smoke. I don't curse. I don't chew. I don't do with the, go run with the girls that do it's what they used to say, you know. It's what the single guys used to say. <clears throat> I'm not dishonest. They spell salvation D-O-N-T, don't. Truth is, they're not doing anything. Mm -hmm. They're not good for nothing either. Ah, I better hush. When Jesus died on the cross. He paid the price for salvation, and he said, it is finished. And real salvation is in the Lord Jesus Christ. The real salvation that will take you to heaven is not spelled D-O. And it's not spelled D-O-N-T. It's spelled D-O-N-E. It's done. That's the only way you'll go to heaven. It's trust in the Lord Jesus. That's the only way you'll get there. Complete salvation is in the Lord Jesus Christ. You can't keep yourself saved. You can't save yourself if you wanted to. There's no other way, you see. Uh, through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus, he accomplished the work of redemption. Salvation was finished with his suffering on the cross, with his shed blood. That's the only way you're going to get saved. You can't save yourself. Here's the third thing. Salvation uh, is, was finished on the cross. Suffering was finished on the cross. And Satan was finished on the cross. Oh. Satan was finished. When Jesus said it is finished, it finished Satan. And the devil don't want you to know this. He's like the fellow that came home from, from, uh, from, from one day from work and he's all beat up, had blood on his nose, and dried blood on his face, and his shirt was kind of torn. And his wife asked him, what in the world happened to you? <laughs> and he said, well, there's some guys jumped me down the, down the road there before I got home. Tried to rob me. His wife said, tried to rob you? I said, yeah. Tore up his clothes. She said, my goodness. What did you do? He said, I followed him off. I didn't let him rob me. I said, why in the world did you do that? I said, I wasn't going to let him take my money. He said, she said, well, how much money you got? He said, a dollar and a quarter. <laughs> she said, I think I'd just give him the dollar and a quarter. He said, I didn't want him to know how broke I am. Yeah, that's the way the old devil is. He's broke. He just don't want you to know it. But he is. You see, he, he is. The, the power we give him is the power we give him. Amen. As children of God, you see, he has a bluff. His power is finished. Do you remember what Jesus said in John chapter, chapter 12? He's talking about going to the cross. He's about to go to the cross, and he's talking there with his disciples, and he makes a statement that we often overlook in chapter number 12, verse number 31. He says, Now shall the prince of this world cast out. Be cast out. He's talking about Calvary. He said the work on Calvary is going to finish Satan. 
His power is going to be limited very much so. And it is for those that trust the Lord Jesus. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse number 14. It's an important passage. If you read that chapter and you read down to verse number 14, you, you remember you study about spiritual warfare. You'll find out, of course, that uh, God has given us power as God's children through the Lord Jesus Christ in his name and through the cross, the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, on the cross, him dying on the cross, the power of the cross, the power of the Lord Jesus, the name of the Lord, and through the shed blood of the Lord. You study spiritual warfare, you'll find that to be true. Those three elements. What he's done, who he is, and the power of the shed blood. It's amazing, that power in the cross. The power of who he is, the power you and I have. He said in Hebrews chapter 2, verse number 14, Through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. That's the reason he died, one of the reasons he died. And the reason he's victorious, he shows us through his own death, he conquered death. Oh, yes, he conquered this because the devil came into the Garden of Eden. There was no death in this world until what? Until sin came through the devil. Tempted Eve, and she fell subject, and, and Adam, he fell subject, and then death came into the world. So death passed upon all men, for they all have sinned. Oh, my, you realize that? There was no tears shed before, before sin came into the world. There was no, not a single funeral. Before sin came into the world. There was no headaches, no heartaches, no problems, no belly aches. Before sin came into the world. No hurricanes, no explosions, no nothing. Before sin came into the world. But ever since then, boy, there's always been what? Death. Troubles and trials and problems. Oh my. Death came with the devil. And so death, Jesus finished death. With his death on the cross and the resurrection proves it. Hallelujah. He finished the power of Satan. Oh, he can still cause doubt in our lives when we allow him to, when we listen to him, and when we walk with him instead of believing the promises of God. Oh, there's now therefore no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, after the spirit. He completed, he's completed Appearance. But then I want to hurry and say his continuing appearance. That's found in verse 24. Look at it. The Bible says in verse 24, For Christ is not entered into the holy place made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. He took his own blood and he went into the real holy of holies. Now here, we illustrated it. They illustrated it year after year. But in the real holy of holies, there in heaven, he took his own blood and sprinkled the mercy seat. Oh, that Ark of the Covenant was there in the literal presence of God. It represented the literal presence of God here on earth. It was a Big figure of the truth. But when the Jewish Christians, the Jewish Christians, that's who the book of Hebrews is written to, when they started reading this, they started understanding the picture of what Jesus did for them. He says to them, you know the tabernacle, you know the Ark of the Covenant and the beautiful Solomon's Temple. When I was in Jerusalem uh, there in the Holy Land. They have, a, they have places you can go. They have a, have a model of the city of Jerusalem back in Solomon's day. An actual model, drawn to scale, built to scale. It's big as this whole auditorium. It's bigger than this whole auditorium. I mean, it wouldn't fit in this auditorium. A scale of the city. You walk around, you look. I took pictures of it, tried to take video of it. It's unbelievable. Of the whole city of Jerusalem back in Solomon's day. The temple, all that. You can go to the uh, Temple Institute, boy, you see the pictures and the illustration of the actual temple, Solomon's temple. They're ready to rebuild that thing. They've got all the stones, everything hewn out in, in a place secure, ready to re-put the, put the temple together. Uh, it's amazing. Of course, uh, they're, they're looking for the Messiah. Uh, they're waiting. Of course, the, the Lord's going to allow them to rebuild that thing during the tribulation period, I believe. But uh, when, when you read Revelation, you read about John seeing the heaven and the, the true temple open. 
And when you read that, of course, you see, you see this uh, illustration. The real Holy of Holies Jesus talked about, the Bible talks about here in the book of Hebrews, that Jesus took his own blood and went into the real Holy of Holies and he sprinkled it with his own blood, thereby making atonement for our sins forever. And then what did he do? It's a real present tense. The Bible says it here. He not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are a figure of the truth, but into heaven itself. He went into heaven itself. There with the Father. Now to appear in the presence of God, what for us? He took away our sin there, uh, which was forever with his own blood. Now he's taking in the present tense. Be sure to understand that. He's continuing to appear. The Bible said he sat down at the right hand of the Father. He's continuing his work. Christ is appearing right now at the right hand of the Father in the presence of God. What's he doing there? Now in his spirit, he's in my life. By his presence of his Holy Spirit, he dwells within me. Through his spirit, he's in my heart. His resurrected body is at the right hand of the Father. What's he doing there, preacher? He's right there. With the Father. What's he doing? He's representing his blood on my behalf. Now don't, don't let this get away with you. I'll let you go to shout one time. I'll, I'll have a heart attack. I promise you. I'll fall out up here on the stage. I'll let you jump out and start shouting if you ever get this picture. Satan is called the accuser of the brethren. He's accuser. Let me tell you what he does. Him and his demonic forces. They haunt us. And they belittle us. And at times, I believe, like they did in Job's day, they try to draw attention to our failures. And devil's dogging our footsteps and trying to make us slip up and fall all they can. And he says, uh, boy, you sure failed today, didn't you? You sure tripped up today, didn't you? You didn't honor God with your life today, did you? You missed that opportunity, didn't you? Boy, you slipped up right there, didn't you? Hmm? And boy, I just go to praying. Lord, help me. And in the presence of God, there is one there to represent me. When he says, uh, that's your child down there, Joel? Well, he ain't look like your child. He ain't acting like your child. He ain't performing like your child. And he ain't look like one of your servants that bears your name. Look at him. Boy, he's defeated, ain't he? He's failing, ain't he? He ain't worth much to you today, is he? Thank God I've got an advocate in the throne room of heaven. Amen. Sitting right there with the Father, Brother Barry. His name is the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know what he says? He's interceding. See, Scale, you sang that song with a trio, and he's ever interceding to the Father for his children. <laughs> Woo! Hallelujah! Boy, I'm telling you, that almost happened this morning about 4 o'clock. See, Scale would jump clean out of the bed, come running in there and see what happened to me. That's about what happened. Boy, I'm telling you, that got a hold of me. I said, thank you, Lord. I just went to squall and said, thank you, Lord, that you're interceding. When I fail, when I fall short, you're still there. You don't walk away. You don't hang your head and say, well, I wish he'd do better. No, you know what he does? <laughs> Hebrews chapter 7, verse number 25, the Bible says he's continuing his work. He's pleading my case. The Bible says, Hebrews chapter 4 and verse number 14, you read those verses, the Bible says, Seeing then that we have a high priest that is passed in the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our professions. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was at all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. That means he's been where I am. He knows what I'm going through, but he didn't fail. Woo! But he knows what it's like. He knows in bad days. He knows what it's like when you're tempted. He knows what it's like when you feel like a failure. He said, when we're tempted, 
he said, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. He's that high priest which can be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. He knows. He knows what it's like. And I cry out to him. I say, Lord, you know what I'm going through. I'm sorry I let you down. Hebrews 7.25 says, Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost. That word uttermost means completely, all the way. He's going to take us all the way. He ain't going to bring us halfway and drop us. He's going to take us all the way. As long as he's up there, <laughs> all the way uttermost unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. He's ever interceding. You know what he's doing? He's making intercession. Simon Peter was tempted. Tempted by Satan. Jesus told him he was going to be. He told him. I'm going to the cross. I'm going to die. Peter didn't want to hear that. Why don't you set up your kingdom now, Lord? I got plans. I got plans. Don't mess up my plans, Lord. I got plans. And Jesus said, no, I'm going to the cross. Oh, put that, oh, put that out of your mind, Lord. We're going to set up the kingdom. And Jesus said, no, I'm going to the cross. He said, I'll, I'll, I'll never. He said, you're going to deny me? Oh, I'll never deny you, Lord. I, I'll, I'll go to prison. I, I, I'll never deny you, Lord. I, 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 I'll do it. I, I'll die for you. And the Lord said, Why, well, you'll deny me three times before the, before the sun, before the cock ever crows. You'll deny me. And he said to him, But I prayed for you, Peter. I prayed for you. I prayed for you, Peter. He said, When you are converted, when you get turned around, you strengthen the brethren. Huh? You're going to go through a little spell here. You're going to lose some ground because you're not trusting the right things. You're trusting in yourself. Self will do that to you. When you get turned around, he didn't lose his salvation. Hallelujah. <laughs> he said, but I prayed for you. Hey, can I tell you this? Watch this now. Somebody's praying for you. How important it is that somebody's praying for you. Look around that person beside you, in front of you, behind you, wherever they are, close to you. Look at them right now and say, somebody's praying for you. Will you do that? Do it right now. Look, look to them. Say, somebody's praying for you. Somebody's praying for you. Oh, somebody's praying for you. I won't tell you somebody is. Somebody is. You may feel like sometimes you're all alone, feel like nobody knows what you're going through, but I want to tell you, somebody's praying for you. Somebody's praying. The Bible says this is a sin when we don't pray for one another. John chapter 17, verse number 15, Jesus said concerning his disciples then, concerning his disciples now, he said, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from evil. He's praying for you. He knows what you're going through. He knows where you're at. I'm glad I can tell people that don't matter where you're at, don't matter what you're going through, there's somebody that knows what you're going through. There's somebody that cares what you're going through. And there's somebody praying for you. There's somebody praying for you. Here's the last thing I'm done. The crown in appearance of the Lord. The crown in appearance. The Bible says in verse number 28, He was once offered to bear the sins of many. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. I, I believe there's something about this verse that's so, so intriguing, so amazing. I could preach for an hour here. I'm not. Don't get scared. I'm done. We're commanded to look for his coming. Look for it, to live for it. To long for it. And I'm convinced. I, I really am. I think it's a good sign of somebody's salvation when they're looking for the Lord to come. I talk to people and they say, Boy, I'm looking for the Lord to come. I want the Lord to come, preacher. I've got a longing for the Lord to come. It's a good sign, boy. They're in tune 
with God. I, I think Jesus may come back today. I hear people say that. Because <laughs> people who are longing for the Lord to come, there's something about it. The Bible says here, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him, look for him, he's going to appear. He's going to appear without sin unto salvation. And what's he talking about here? You say, preacher, I thought it was already, we are saved. It's actually talking about when he appears. When he appears, what? It's going to be the crowning moment of salvation. I talked about it earlier. What? He's going to take us out of this old world of sin. And he's going to change this old vile body that we live in that's full of sin. Sin cursed body. You got one. Yeah, you, you may not think so right now, but I promise you, you live long enough, you'll know it. Uh huh. That's right. That pain's going to catch up with you. <laughs> Ain't enough arthritis medicine in the world going to stop all of it. Amen. <laughs> Amen. That's right. Uh, but I thank God there are some good things. But, but hey, hallelujah, he's going to crown us one of these days with his coming. The salvation experience, the crowning work when he saved us of his presentation. We're saved from the penalty. We're being saved from the power. And one of these days from the very presence of sin. You see these verses? It literally shows us Jesus as prophet, priest, and king. As a prophet, he came into this world as our savior. As a priest, he's appearing in the Holy of Holies in heaven at the right hand of the Father is our sustainer. And one of these days he's going to appear as king, sovereign rule over all the world. And it's all because of his complete work on Calvary. Do you know him today? Is he calling to you today? Has he opened your heart today? Do you know him as Savior? If he is, will you come? Trust him today. Let's stand for prayer. Father, I want to thank you for the truth of your word. I want to thank you, Lord, for speaking to our hearts today, the realization of who you are and what you've done for us on that cross of Calvary, Lord Jesus. The completed work, the continuing work, the crowning work, how you appear here in Hebrews chapter 9. Lord, I pray... You're speaking, if you're speaking today, opening the heart of someone, they come to you without hesitation. Trust you as their only hope of heaven. I'm glad you will. Make them a child of yours. Don't turn them away. You say it, all the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that comes to me I will in no wise cast him out. Have your will and your way in this invitation. We'll trust you, we'll praise you, we'll honor and glorify you for all that you do. In Jesus' name. Amen. We're singing. Page 385. God speaking. You will be obedient to him right now. It's an invitation. Be obedient to him. In Jesus' name.